We're pleased that you're joining us for the afternoon session. It'll be a, a discussion between with do, both Dr. Manson and Dr. Collins discussing it. I also have the honor of introducing Dr. Manson over here in the corner. Dr. Manson is a professor of philosophy at Mississippi University and has been there for 20 years. He's also had res, uh, research fellowships at the University of Aberdeen and Notre Dame. His central research areas of concern are metaphysics, the philosophy of science, and the philosophy of religion. He also teaches courses in critical thinking and logic, environmental and biomed biomedical ethics, the philosophy of religion, and issues in the science of religion. In addition to those undergraduate courses, he teaches graduate seminars in religion and then the philosophy of science. He's one of the leading thinkers in the design argument. He has more than 15 publications, including God and Design, an anthology, in, in addition to engaging the discipline in standard ways, like through um, peer-reviewed journals, Neil also engages students and others with electronic, through electronic media. He has a TikTok with a following of 21,000. He has uh, a, gas, a video on gaslighting with over, that went viral with over a million hits. Neil's a good friend from graduate school in, at Syracuse University. He's a challenging thinker. I always knew when he was, when I was in for a challenge because he'd start off, well, Dave. <laughs> and then I knew we were, we were in for a good discussion. So Neil is one of our speakers right now. Josh Rasmussen from the philosophy department is here to introduce Dr. Collins. Thank you, David. It's my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker, Robin Collins. Robin Collins is a distinguished professor of philosophy at Messiah College. He earned his PhD in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, which is also where I got my PhD. And I got to know Robin Collins pretty early in my own career. I was a computer science undergrad, having questions about the work that Robin Collins was doing at that time. And since that time, when I got into graduate school, I discovered that Robin Collins is pretty famous. Uh, different professors in the field would be referring to him as the leading thinker on this topic that he's talking about today. Um, and since that time, he's done some new work, some recent discoveries that he's going to be talking about, which I'm very excited about to hear. Collins has written over 50 articles and book chapters in philosophy with some of the leading academic presses spanning the areas of philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, philosophical theology, as well as the philosophy of mind. He has given invited talks at many colleges and universities, such as Oxford University, Cambridge University, Stanford University, Yale University, etc. He's appeared on many nationally broadcast programs, such as PBS, Closer to Truth, Stanford University's Philosophy Talk Radio, and many other places. He's internationally recognized as a leading expert on the fine-tuning argument, as I discovered early in my graduate school work, and even increasingly since then. Professor Collins' recent work explores how the laws and fundamental parameters of the universe appear to be optimized for our ability to do science and to discover the universe. He's recently received a large grant uh, from Templeton to uh, support his work, and I'm very, very excited to see um, what he's going to present for us tonight. So join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here on this Saturday afternoon. And thank you, Neil. I look forward to um, a discussion with you and your responses. OK, so um, the fine tuning for scientific discovery, that's the title of the talk. I'm going to give a little background for it. OK, God and the success of science is um, fine tuning for scientific discovery. There's the talk, OK. And so first, I want to review the anthropic fine-tuning argument. That's what I talked about this morning. It's going to be just a real brief review. And this is um, evidence that's been known since probably really started picking up in the late 1970s and in the 80s that the universe in its basic structure was very, very unimaginably precisely set so that life could occur. So if things were slightly different, you wouldn't have any life. So that's been much discussed. And then I wrote a major essay on that. And that's where I initially started um, my work on the whole fine-tuning business. And that's called the anthropic fine-tuning 
really translate that as fine-tuning for life. And then, <clears throat> um, the big, other than theism, a belief in God, the big alternative explanation for this, like a lot of cosmologists and physicists, major figures, um, who aren't theists hold to this explanation called the multiverse explanation. So, according to this hypothesis, there are an enormous number of universes with different initial conditions, values of the fundamental parameters of physics, and even the laws of nature. So basically have a different physical structure. And there's an enormous number of them. So if you get enough of them, even if it's extremely unlikely that one of them um, will be life permitting, enough of them, the life permitting one eventually shows up. Just like print enough lottery tickets, eventually somebody's going to win, and hopefully it's me. <laughs> Though I have never bought a lottery ticket, so I think I could win. <laughs> but um, so humans are winners of the cosmic lottery. That's the idea, um, is the anthropic explanation or the ex multiverse explanation of this kind of fine tuning for life. Now, it cru and this is going to be crucial for this part of the talk when I talk about the fine tuning for scientific discovery and how the multiverse can explain that fine tuning. The one for life um, relies on what's called the observer selection effect. Um, it is no coincidence as generic observers, there's nothing being special about us, we find ourselves in an observer permitted universe, the claim is, since we could not have found ourselves in any other kind of universe. Thus, the multiverse not only renders it unsurprising that some universe has these observers, but it also renders it unsurprising that we observe our universe to be fine-tuned for life because we couldn't have existed in any other kind of universe. So it takes away any coincidence left to be explained. That's the idea. Now, not everybody agrees it does take away all the coincidences, but that's the basic argument. So now we're going to go into the fine-tuning for scientific discovery, and then I'll show how, uh, we briefly say why it avoids this objection. So that's one of its big significance, is that that objection doesn't work for it. So the initial observation behind this is that many physicists and philosophers have noticed that the fundamental order of nature is much more science-friendly than would be expected by chance. Um, and I eventually came to call this the fine-tuning for scientific discovery. Now here are some examples. Albert Einstein famously said the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. Um, they, he was very surprised by that, how comprehensible it was. Eugene Wigner, he was one of the major founders of our fundamental physical theory we have today, a framework, um, quantum theory. Um, and he said, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. In fact, partly referring to our ability to actually formulate these laws in a mathematically beautiful way, because beauty has been a guide for um, the physicist. So he wrote a famous paper on that, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Sciences, and you can find it easily on the internet. Just type it in. Okay. And then here's Paul Davies, and he notes the problem with the multiverse explanation. He says, it is perfectly possible for there to exist a universe that permits the existence of observers who nonetheless do not or cannot make much sense of nature, that it's not intelligible to them. Um, in fact, the physics of our universe is extremely special, being both simple and comprehensible to the human mind. And then he says, he notes that this understandability factor is left out of anthropic, which is multiverse explanations. So why is it, um, why can't it dis um, explain this? Well, here's, I have my diagram. Here's all these universes that allow for observers. These are in the multiverse hypothesis. Okay, all these observers. Here's our universe. And there's all these sad 
scientist wannabes in these other universes, but they're not very good for scientific discovery. So aren't we lucky to be in this one here that is so good for scientific discovery? So if it really is set to optimize or very good, then there's a coincidence that we find ourselves here instead of all these other places. And that coincidence can't be explained by the multiverse because there's no observer selection effect. We could have very well been over here with the sad face. Okay, so that's the idea. So it avoids the multiverse uh, objection, which is the major one. So I was aware of these late 90s, aware of the people noticing this in the fundamental structure of the laws of nature, that they seem miraculously structured for discoverability. But while working on the evidence for the anthropic fine-tuning, I was going through the physical evidence to make sure it really worked out. Sometimes physicists would say things that it wasn't well grounded physically, so I was working through the physics of it. Then I, ran, I started running across another kind of fine-tuning. So eventually the idea occurred to me to quantify and test this fine-tuning for scientific discovery. And how I could do that is I could vary um, the values of the fundamental parameters and see if it's really fine-tuned for scientific discovery, then those fundamental numbers that I talked about last time, and I'll explain what they are just in a minute, if you made them larger or smaller, then either the discoverability of the universe would remain the same or get worse. If they got better, then we wouldn't be at the best optimal place for scientific discovery. So it was a very testable hypothesis. So I need to go back and remind everybody what a fundamental parameter is. It's a number that occurs in the deepest equations of physics and is not the result of more fundamental quantities. So we'll look at examples. So here, the masses of the proton and neutron, they are not fundamental because their mass is the result of the mass of constituent quarks. So that, that mass is not a fundamental number, but the mass of these up and down quarks that compose them are fundamental. Likewise, the mass of the electron, mass of the quarks and electrons, they are fundamental because they are at the deepest level. There's nothing further that explains those masses. Okay? Um, and then there's other parameters. There's like around 30 or so total in physics and cosmology. Now here's another example. I talked about the mass parameters. This came up in my first talk, that Newton's gravitational constant G right there on the force law. That's also a fundamental parameter. It's a fundamental parameter at a large scale, um, which would be classified as one of the cosmic parameters, the Newton's universal uh, G, because it can't be explained within our current theory by anything deeper, any deeper parameter. So I had these initial cases. 2010 was my first, I was actually out in California when I came across this. I was on, um, I think it was on sabbatical that semester and I was visiting my mother-in-law out in the desert. So it was the California idea. I get good ideas out here. So uh, I started noticing when I define structure constant, it is one, it was my first case, it's a fundamental parameter that governs the strength of the electromagnetic force. That's the force of electricity and magnetism, which I had said in my previous talk was responsible for radio waves, cell phone you know, signals, light. And it governs that force. If it's stronger, the electromagnetic force is stronger. And if it's, um, or if it's larger, and if it's smaller, it would be weaker. So then what's the consequence of that? So this is the first case I came across. And the consequence is if you could show that if it's slightly larger, there wouldn't be any have ability to have or open wood fires. And if you don't have open wood fires, it's very unlikely beings like us would have ever discovered um, how to smelt and forge metals. Because they think it was discovered in the Middle East and people had, you know, found that their campfires, maybe cooking some meat, and then they noticed some um, naturally occurring copper melted. And wow, we can do something with that. So obviously smelting metals is made of metal. There wouldn't be any scientific technology if you couldn't smelt metals or even glass. We couldn't have controlled fire. 
So really important for the development of civilization and science itself. And then what actually you can show um, in atomic units, it's a special unit system you can use that simplifies your equations in this context. That, and this is our, so I'm giving you just a brief intuitive explanation for why this works. A lot of my other cases are much more abstract. So the intuitive explanation here is, if you've ever been around like a campfire and you look at it, you'll notice this part is not burning anymore. Well, why is that? Or I'll get to that in a moment. Sorry, I jumped ahead here. So the um, radiation emitted by wood, this is emitting radiation, that's why you can feel the temperature of the fire, is proportional to alpha squared. So if you doubled alpha, it would emit four times as much radiant energy. But the convection and combustion rate remains the same in these units. So basically, if I doubled alpha, it would pull out radiant energy, and the fire, because of energy conservation, there has to be the same amount of energy coming in of combustion is going out. The temperature of the fire would have to go down. And very quickly, by raising alpha, it goes down below the combustion point. The opposite is also the case, and this is on the next slide, um, but it's about 10 to 20 percent raise. If you were to decrease it, right now, well, right now it's such that it's too high to keep the surfaces of these, once they become charcoal, to burning. If you lowered it, then those surfaces could continue burning because they would be releasing less, less radiant energy. But you have to have some, to keep it burning, there has to be coals against it. And that's actually good for, um, there's a good um, result of that. There's less forest fires, houses don't burn down really as easy. Like if you put a little gasoline on a wood floor, it would actually go out because it doesn't have any source of radiant energy up back from it. So if you, little increase in that fine structure concept, no biomass fire, so that would be really unlikely to have any science at all, as we know it, any kind of advanced science. And then you would, things would be worse if you lowered it in terms of forest fire. And then there's a whole bunch of other um, negative consequences of lowering it for the light microscope loses resolving power. It's just, the light microscope has just enough resolving power to see the smallest living cell. And you need light microscopes to see living things. You can't do it under an electron microscope. If you decreased it, you would lose, um, transformers would become a lot less efficient and motors at some point becoming impossible. So there's a lot of discoverability constraints here. That's the open wood fire one and a whole bunch of others on the lower end. So it's trapped in a very good place, this alpha. So I had this initial hypothesis I came up with. These are the early days of 2010. Well, maybe there's an optimality for our use of tools or scientific tools Maybe, and that's what I focused on for discoverability, is the ability, how good our tools were. And so, like our, uh, the light microscope or fire is also a tool to, um, for science to um, smelt and forge metals. So here is the fine structure constant, much less useful would be, if this is the general hypothesis for any parameter. If you moved it, made it smaller, less useful, make it larger, less useful. So it was in this optimal point for scientific discovery. That was the idea. Now, what I ultimately wanted to see if, if this fine tuning was over and above the fine tuning for life. Is there an additional fine tuning for discoverability? So I really want cases that the anthropic the discoverability optimality range to see if there was cases in which that range was small compared to the range of the parameter that allows for life. And that's what in 2014 or so, after um, a response by um, Sean Carroll at um, Caltech, um, that's when I started looking into particle physics. And I wanted parameters where you had a well-defined range and then you would have discoverability effects and that was going to be a small subregion. So, so then the parameters I looked at were two cosmic parameters where I could do calculations on them. 
and then about 11 fundamental parameters of particle physics. And they all exhibited the fine tuning. It took me years. I mean, I spent 13 years on this. And some, in some of the cases, I thought I'd refuted my hypothesis. Um, and then I would discover one time it took several months, but, or two years, one case, but I find, would discover I'd made a mistake in the calculation. So, um, and I've checked, a lot of them I checked over with other physicists. So, um, my initial hypothesis was that tool optimality one, that things were optimal for doing science, but I begin to also notice a deeper pattern when I started looking at the fine tuning for scientific discovery. I both noticed a deeper pattern and also I saw that people would raise this kind of issue. Well, what, what's so important about scientific discovery? Well, what seemed even more important than scientific discovery was discovering that the world was discoverable. That would have the, all these metaphysical implications, okay, that for us to actually discover this. So then the idea occurred to me maybe it's fine-tuned for the discoverability of discoverability. Um, and there was this deeper pattern, maybe that deeper pattern fit into that. So eventually, I tried to draw predictions from the discoverability of discoverability. I had to make it more precise, the way I could get predictions from it. So eventually, you're getting a recent rendition of this. I call it the discovery signaling hypothesis. The values of the fundamental parameters fall into those ranges of values that they would have if the universe had a creator and that creator were trying to signal in a maximally convincing way that the universe is fine-tuned for the success of science. Okay? So actually this idea of signaling has precedent in the physics literature. And this is two physicists, um, S. Uh, Shu, I think is his name, and AZ in um, an article in Modern Physics that is, they asked this question. Suppose some superior being or beings got the universe going and that they eventually wanted to notify us that the universe was intentionally created. The question we would ask, like to ask is this, how would they send us a message? And then they go on to conclude that this could only be done via the cosmic microwave background radiation. I'll talk about that in a minute. There's, co there's microwave radiation permeating all of space that's left over from the way the universe began in a Big Bang. Um, so, and, and then people have actually looked for if there's a message, they haven't found it, okay? So there's a couple articles out on that. Um, but they didn't consider the possibility of doing it via the fundamental parameters. So how would you do it via the fundamental parameters? Well, to send a signal, there's like three requirements for an effective signal. Whatever your pattern is you're sending has to be psychologically associated with whatever message you're trying to um, send. Um, second, you can't just ascribe the pattern to chance. If you could describe it to chance, you wouldn't think there was any intention. It's not going to be a signal for you. And finally, the recipients have to recognize the pattern and it meets those requirements. So you could say association, not by chance, and recognizability. That's what you actually get in proposals for sending signals you know, to, to out in space for these, um, uh, that letting other potential extraterrestrial life know that we're here. Like some people, Carl Sagan famously said about what a sequence, an increasing sequence of prime numbers, where those are associated with mathematical intelligence. To have a sequence of increasing primes would be very unlikely to happen by chance. And it's a mathematical pattern that's highly recognizable. Like if you did some obscure mathematical pattern that came through, you know, would just attribute it you wouldn't recognize it, so you wouldn't think anything of it. So it has to meet all those three conditions, or kind of obvious logical conditions. Okay, and there's a little terminology. Um, this is a little more technical talk, so I have to do a little bit terminology. I use P as just a letter for, generically for a parameter, like the gravitational constant or the mass of a quark. 
would be, that mass would be designated by um, P if I'm just talking about it in general. And then a discoverability contributor, just like a certain features of a car, such as its fuel economy, safety, and so forth, contribute to the car's quality. So all those features together make a good car, um, good quality car. Various measurements in science contribute to a discoverability of a specified domain or the tools. You can also talk about the measurement or the tools that are used. For example, the measurement of distant galaxies by the James Webb Telescope that's um, been recently in the news contribute to discoverability in astrophysics and cosmology. And then for those, um, there's what I call a contributor maximality range. This is a range of values where of the parameter that maximize the ability of whatever contributor to contribute to that area of discoverability. And then there's another term, and I'll remind you what they mean, called the plausible optimality range. This is the set of values of the parameters such that there is no other value of P that is clearly better for discoverability. Okay, and I'll give an analogy with a car in a few moments that you kind of can see how this plays out. So then once you get these requirements, this is the plausible optimality range where you could plausibly think that P was optimal. Um, if you're going to have an effective signal associated with discoverability, you would want a P0, just the value of the parameter in our universe. I use a, a zero, the subscript, to donate our universe. It would, you would expect it to be in the plausible optimality range. If it wasn't, if it was outside of what's plausible to be optimal, it wouldn't be negatively associated with discoverability. So the first requirement is in that range. So that you could plausibly say it's optimal. But then you could go better than that. You could make the association stronger if there was a significant tributor peak that you put in under. So P would be under, that's a member, just means under within that rate range, it's a member of that range, that membership sign from mathematics. It's under some significant contributor. That would even more strongly associate the value of P with discoverability. So here's the car analogy for that. And this analogy actually was a car analogy that helped me develop the whole the signaling hypothesis and its implications. So I worked it out in the case of just a analogy with a car that was, um, that was April 2020, and I very specifically remember it because I had discovered, I thought I'd refuted this whole deeper pattern in the case of the muon two years earlier, and so I'd given up on it, and then I realized my mistake I had made for the mass of a muon is a special fundamental particle. Recalculated and then got my colleague, a particle physics colleague, and he showed me some really official set of equations. We both worked through them, and it turned out to work in that case. So it was April 2020, and I also remember that because I was teaching philosophy of science over Zoom because it was, it was the COVID semester. And I was, said I had this exciting thing. I want to tell my class. So I went through the entire case with my class. Um, so anyhow, that's, that's some of the history behind that. And I came up with a car analogy. The idea is that the car manufacturer wanted to communicate to the customers through the way the car was made and its various adjustments that the engineers really cared about quality. So it was trying to send that message. So what you, would, you could do is here's the air to fuel ratio. That's a carburetor mixes air and fuel together. So that's a parameter. And you know, here's a ratio of I think typical cars are around 14. So if you could suppose that fuel, this is where it's the plausible optimality range when all the other things that the air to fuel ratio affects, like it can affect acceleration, so it affects safety. It could affect the noise the car makes. It could affect the repair rate. So that would be where all those things, when you balance them together, would be plausible to say that the car quality was optimal. And then you could go further, the, if this was like one ten thousandth of the entire range, and you put it in there, and the customers recognize that, they would say, wow, that can just be by chance. That's an, a range that's optimal for fuel economy. And if they saw that multiple times, 
they would think something's up. Maybe the car manufacturer's trying to communicate to me. Okay, that's the idea. So that's what we get for our universe. What would you do with these parameters? Just like in the car place case, you would do it some, under some contributor peak in the POR. But what if there's more than one contributor peak? Then you have to evaluate them and how good they are. Like if you had, um, that's in the, case, uh, the car case up here, like if there's more contributor peaks than one in the POR, you know, pollution, minimal repair costs, maximal highway fuel economy. So then you would say you'd want one that the more important they are, the more they're psychologically associated. The narrower the peak, the less likely it is by chance, so the more likely you're going to ascribe it to intention. And the more recognizable, the better. If somebody doesn't recognize a signal or a pattern, it's useless, hasn't done anything. So um, the rule is if, if uh, uh, a peak is better on one of these criteria and at least comparable on the other than, it's, than another peak, then it's more, what I call more convincing or more effective. So for now, you might not follow all that, just there is a criteria for distinguishing peaks where you'd put it under. And then you can just draw predictions. This is a little complicated slide. I should break some of that stuff up. But you can draw predictions from this hypothesis. That's one of the big deals. Well, you've got to have the parameter in the plausible optimality range. Then you look at the various discoverability contributors that you can recognize. Because remember, it has to be recognizable to work. So if, if there's some hidden one, that's not going to work. So you look at the ones you recognize. You look at where the peaks are. And then if the one peak is much narrower than the other, for instance, it beats the narrowness criteria better, then that's where it predicts it would be. So you were the customer, you thought, maybe they're sending a signal. They're doing this through the parameters. Your, and you, then you did the a plausible optimality range, range for the quality of the car. And that's going to generally be broad because you have to balance different things like effect on safety, the effect on car repair, um, cost of car repair on pollution. And um, you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily know how much to weight them. It would depend on how much you weighted each of those things, even if you had very precise measurements. So that's broad, but these aren't. These could be very peaked, like fuel economy. What's the you could just put that through a program or machine and see what's best for fuel economy. So if you were in this situation, where should you put on those criteria the peak? Or it's here, because that's thinner, that's narrower. It's less likely to fall under this peak than it would be for it to fall under one of these peaks. It's going to be more impressive. And so that's the obvious choice as a narrower one. It stands out in that way in a relevant way. So right there, you see with the car case, you get a definite prediction. So you have a prediction of where the parameters are going to be. So maybe I just ask if there are any questions on clarification at this point. This is all methodology up to this point. What the basic thesis is and what my prediction methodology is. But then just let it run, but send a signal that God know that God exists. Yeah. But it could be, it's perfectly compatible with theism too. It doesn't distinguish between theism and deism. Because an atheistic God that's very involved could do the same thing. Oh, and then uh, how does this relate to uh, determinism? Okay. Um, I don't think it, 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 it doesn't really address that question. It neither implies determinism or imply, implies the opposite. Because it's just about the arrangement of the fundamental structure, not about on a higher level like us whether we're determined or not. Any other questions of clarification? Okay. So if, if, you know, if I lose you on the methodology, then you're not gonna arrest what might not make sense. Okay, so I'm gonna look at um, three examples. The first will be um, give you the general idea, and the second and third examples, that of the masses of the muon and Higgs boson, can be skipped if necessary. But I think I'm 
going. Um, I'm okay on schedule here. <clears throat> so the first illustration has to do with the cosmic microwave background radiation. The actual result I got here, I got very early, right after the case of the fine structure constant. And it was a huge motivator for me. So I just that's part of the autobiography. But I didn't realize its full significance until I had the full methodology developed. So the cosmic microwave background radiation, how many have heard of that? Okay, a few people. So for those who haven't or need a refresher, here's what it is. So there's the universe standard cosmological theory started in a big bang, very, very hot gas, extremely hot. And then as it expanded, the, and this is on the next slide, it started as visible light, very hot visible light. The uh, um, universe at some point became clear, and it became clear where it could travel this radiation anywhere um, when it was about 5,000 degrees Kelvin, which is about the visible region. And then as it began, the universe continued expanding about 1,000 fold from this. And because space was expanding, that's the way it works. It's space itself is expanding. It stretched the light rays. So higher frequency lights, like visible region, have shorter wavelengths, where um, lower frequency electromagnetic radiation has longer wavelengths. So microwave is about in the millimeter region, whereas um, the wavelength of visible lights in the micron, a millionth of a meter region, so it's stretched to the millimeter by a thousand fold. And that's why you get microwave radiation. And it was prediction of the Big Bang Theory and in 1966, by accident, and it was discovered by people at Bell Labs. And they had started picking up this microwave radiation. It was coming from all directions. Now, it's pretty weak, the radiation. So you can't cook a, you know, don't try to cook a ham. Astronauts aren't cooking hamburgers or <laughs> their hot dogs in space using the microwave background radiation. It's, it's fairly weak but it is in the microwave region. And this is a really a key tool for cosmology. Um, the, it's been called the Rosetta Stone, in which inscribed the record of the universe's past history in space and time. So I said the CMB is fairly weak, and the cosmologists are trying to look at information encoded in uh, variations in one part in a million of this. So. That requires enormously sensitive instruments. So naturally, the stronger it would be, if it was stronger, it would be better as an instrument of cosmology to study the universe. So the more intense the CMB, the better variations it can measure. And this is the measurement you see down here. So and that strength of the CMB depends on another cosmic parameter called the matter to photon ratio. It's the amount of matter um, in a cubic meter of space divided by the number of photons. A photon is a particle of light. So light is wave particle duality. You can also speak of light in terms of particles. And it remains almost constant, so it's, it's a parameter that characterizes the constant. And it's the, the intensity of the CMB, the cosmic microwave radiation, depends on and it, you know the textbooks I was reading. This was um, uh, it was I think this was December 2000 or in the fall of 2010 after the case of the fine structure constant. This was the next one I looked at because I knew it was really puzzling why there, it had the value it did, and I was wondering about whether it was optimized. It maximized the CMB. Maybe you know, if I found it maximized the CMB, then that would be evidence I was on the right track with discovery optimality. So in my first calculation, so my prediction was it maximized the CMB. It would have that value. My first calculation, however, um, it turned out I thought I refuted my idea because it was way off, way off from maximizing the CMB. So it, once again, it was a California story. <laughs> I was out in California, and I was visiting my mother 
in La, out in, and she lives about 20 miles outside of Palm Springs. And I realized, oh, I made a stupid mistake here, recalculated, and that was January 2011. And this is the curve I got. So right here, this is the strength of the CMB, and this is the, that number compared to one in our universe. So this is where our universe is at. Notice we are at the peak. So I immediately sent it off to a couple cosmologist friends of mine for verification. They did verify it. Then a couple other people verified it. So this has been well verified, at least all the basic calculations for this half. So here, if we were here, we would have a less intense CMB, like if it was two, three, four, it was five times um, as large, then the CMB would be a lot less than this here. So we're at a maximum point. That was extremely exciting for me. And one of the um, people, this was a person in superstring theory, wrote back me an email, it's an amazing result. Um, so I'm not going to go through the intuitive understanding right now. If we have time, I can go back and why you get that result. And here I'm just going to say, when I did further calculations, um, taking into account various, that was like a, what they call a first order calculation, where you don't look at all the subtleties. Um, and in that calculation, it was like, um, we were 8% higher than the value that maximized the CMB, well within the margin of uncertainty. But then when I put all the other factors in, I got an amazing, which surprised me, 0.7%, which was um, much more accurate than I would have expected by the uncertainty in the parameter. So in the end, I only, um, I have to calculate, remember the width of the contributors, because the narrower they are, the better they are for discovery. So in this direction, the width of this contributor, I gave a 50, allowed a 50% uncertainty in the parameters, which um, were somewhere within that 50% range. So that's the width of this peak for maximality. Okay, so we have a curve here. You can't get a precise width because of uncertainty, a lack of precise knowledge of the value of some of the things that go into the calculation. Now, I, I always hear this objection right away. Well, there's a kind of discoverability selection effect is that, well, if the parameter wasn't discoverable, we would have never known it about. So of course, all the parameters we discover, we find we're going to have them in the range where we could discover them because we wouldn't have known about them otherwise. But the simplest answer to this is that, well, it's not that, I'm not claiming that it's fine-tuned so we could discover this CMB. It's that it's optimized for its use. And there, if we existed here, we would know about the CMB. We just would know after we did the calculation that it wasn't optimal. So you can't explain this by that kind of what's called a selection effect. Now, to get this, I, I needed to find some way of getting an anthropic range for this. So to do that, I combined it with another parameter. I looked at the joint, did they jointly affect each other, the dark energy density. So let me explain what that is and then how you put the two together. So the dark energy density, I had mentioned that in my first talk, that's this energy that you don't see that's fill, filling out all of space. Okay? So um, its density, as the universe expands, its density remains constant. And because of this, if you work it out in the equations, Einstein's equation, it acts as a repulsive force. So pushing things apart, where gravity is also operating between the masses of the universe, attracting them, everything. So as the universe expands, this dark energy, its repulsive force remains the same. But the gravi gravity gets weaker because as it expands, there's less and less matter, where the amount of dark energy is just a, stays a constant, the way it works. So eventually, as the universe expands, Around 6.3 billion years ago, the dark energy um, became dominant. We're at 13.8.8 .8 billion years from the Big Bang. 
6.3 billion years ago, dark energy became, the, became dominant, overcame the gravitational attraction. This caused the universe to begin to expand at an accelerating rate as shown in this diagram here. So it was slowing down due to the attraction of gravity. But then dark energy began to dominate and now it's accelerating its expansion. Okay, so those are what you need to know about dark energy. And now the dark energy density has a very special value. There's another coincidence involved in this. Um, this is a coincidence, this is one of those, a lot of the cases are already recognized at least in part by cosmologists or particle physicists, it's coincidences. And this one, um, that they're roughly equal to each other um, in their density, a state of affairs so unlikely that cosmologists have taken to calling it the cosmic coincidence problem. So you see here, here's dark energy and dark matter. They're not, they're roughly equal. This is about twice what this is. But as the universe continues to expand, this will be just nothing compared to this. And earlier in the universe, this will dominate over that. So we're just at this kind of point where they're roughly equal to each other. And co cosmologists have noted the coincidental nature of that. So how does this relate to discoverability? Well, if you increase that rho d, the, which is the dark energy density, the universe will have expanded by the time um, more, by the time civilizations develop. So if you go back to the previous slide, we're out here somewhere at 13 billion years, okay? So if you increase the dark energy density, the accelerated expansion begins to occur earlier and earlier, and it, be, and it, it, it it accelerates at a rapid rate, an exponential rate. And so the universe would expand a lot more, and the more it expands, the weaker the CMB, because it's stretching the light. And it makes weaker light. Its energy density goes down, or its intensity goes down with the fourth power, um, inverse with the expansion. So if it expands twice as much as one-eighth of what it would, um, or one-sixteenth of what it would otherwise be. Okay, so, the larger it is, the worse it's going to be for the CMB. But you also, you don't want it too small because if it's too small, you never find out about dark energy. And knowing about it has, is very important for knowing about the fundamental structure of the universe. That's why physicists were very excited about finding this, is it tells us a lot about the fundamental structure um, of the nature of the universe. So the ideal situation is to just be large enough to be discovered but no larger than necessary. And it appears to be that way. Once the Hubble telescope went up in 1989 and they started collecting data, by 1998 they already collected the data from supernovas. They um, compared it with what the expansion should be and it was more than it should be. And that was sufficient to get sufficient evidence with 99% probability that um, there was dark energy. And if you had, if it was like twice as much dark energy, it would have been 99.99999% and it'd be much more than you needed. So it should be in that range somewhere would be ideal. So that's where it appears to be. And now, so we've got the um, CMB, the dark energy, and what you get is this ideality region around where it is, of, has a width, in this direction on the um, she, that's a Greek parameter direction, matter to photon ratio of that much, E naught, and this much here, so you get that, that's the ra ideality range, has to be within that peak around D naught and around E naught. Okay, and you'll see that in the next diagram. So, now we need to calculate the anthropic region. Remember I said that I wanted it to be a small part of the anthropic region. I wanted to see how much the universe was fine-tuned for discovery, for this um, the discoverability of discoverability over and above the anthropic region, the region of for life. So a 2006 article 
shows this anthropic region here. And when you calculate it all out, um, what you get, and you get that constraint, I can always come back to that, but here becomes the anthropic region. And or here's the range for the she can go all the way from here to here. And the dark energy density could go, if you're way out here in this space, you could be over 6,000 times what it is now. And we're in this really small region here, the ideality region, which is about one in um, 3,000 of the entire anthropic range. You have a fine tuning here now, one in part in 3,000, but then I needed to look if there's other peaks that are equally good. I couldn't completely eliminate a peak in the negative dark energy because dark energy can actually be negative. So there's a possible other peak down here somewhere. So we have two peaks, so it's really a fine tuning in one part in 1,500, which is really significant um, to be translated in that probability would be less than 0.1% of that happening. And that's just one case. So I do an intuitive understanding, less than zero. And so by the time I include, I used, you can use different natural variables. I just want to be completely honest and try in another natural variable. So this is the high fine tuning. This is the lower one if you use that different natural variable. And there's reasons for preferring that one. But most of you, that probably um, would ha take me too long to explain that. Um, so there is this fine tuning there. So that was the, one of the first cases in cosmology. Let's see where we're at in time. Let me go through one other case. And now, these are the cases from cosmology. Is there any questions of clarification about those cases? So. The big thing that's driving it is that dark energy, the, the massive amount of fine tuning, is because you want it large enough to be discovered, uh, to make a difference where you could, you could see it really exist, but no larger. And there's a huge space in which it could be larger. And if it's larger, it causes the universe to expand and weakens. As the universe expands, it weakens the cosmic microwave background radiation, and also throws galaxies. In some of those regions, you wouldn't even be able to see another galaxy. So it'd really be a complete death blow to cosmology and astrophysics. Um, so it seems to be in an ideal, the ideal region for that. So here's now the fundamental parameters. This is a table that's called the standard model. It's like the table of the periodic table we once had were the most fundamental constituents of matter, like the elements. Well, this is the new one from the standard model of particle physics. They, just like you found the proton was composed of up and down quarks. Then they found a bunch of other fundamental particles that almost immediately decay away. So only these all only exist here in particle colliders that collide high-energy particles like that one. That's the Higgs boson. And next I'm going to talk about the muon. That exists apart from particle colliders in collisions in the upper atmosphere from very high energy particles called cosmic rays. Okay, So these are the ones I varied because these had a clear anthropic range that was definitively calculable. So then I could look at, they had a discoverability subrange and look at whether the contributors had peaks. So those are the ones I looked at. And if you, <clears throat> the effective anthropic range, if you kind of average it out for all of them, is uh, this is a unit of, can be used as a unit of mass or energy. They're interchangeable in um, fundamental physics. So 86 GeV means giga electron volts. So, Muon is 200 times the mass of the electron. That's what we're we'll focused on. It lasts for 2.2 microseconds. That's millionths of a second. And then it decays into something else. Decays means it just breaks apart. Um, so it only exists as a result of high energy collisions. And then it almost immediately um, falls apart. And that's the one, the fundamental particle with the longest lifetime. 
So if we're talking about trillions, so the next one is a trillionth of it uh, around, a, um, or this one up here, for example, is a trillionth. And that one is even a trillion trillionth of a, a second to last, the top quark. Okay, and so this is just some quotes from physics, how useful the muon is. And I'm going to particularly focus on one use of the muon. And it's kind of just fascinating to think about. So the muons are being produced all the time in the upper atmosphere, about 17, on average, 17 kilometers above where we are. And um, that would be equivalent of around 12 miles or so from where we are. So it shows it here. There being the cosmic rays hit produces muons. And they're all the time irradiating Earth. You can buy a little thing for your cell phone that will count the number of muons. There's about per centimeter squared, there's about one per second. One, one per second or one per minute coming down through. They're highly penetrating particles. You're getting irradiated all the time. So what's the significance of this? Well, these are very actually very useful because they're like x-ray machines. You know, x-ray send rays through like your body and some areas of your body are more dense and so they will show up as light regions on the, um, or the dark regions that absorb more x-rays. Um, and so here's what one use of them. Um, they're used in mining, pyramids, and particle physics. But here's, I'm just going to show an easy one with the pyramid. There's actually, there's like a PBS program on this. Here's the muons all coming down. And here's a, one of the pyramids, it's like 75 meters tall. So that's about over 200 feet tall. And these muons are coming through. And they're looking for if there's a hidden chamber. So if there is a hidden chamber, it's much easier for a muon to go through this region than this region. It will tend to be more likely to be absorbed going through this region than that region. So you'll find that this detector down at the right here, muon detector, fewer muons going from this through that than going through here. And then they can move different detectors because they're coming from all directions. And then they can do a 3D imaging of that chamber. And so, and, and you never could get an x-ray through that. So th these are highly penetrated. They can, they, here, they can go through seven, um, you know, 200 feet. They can, they're used for the particle big detectors are about 100 meters, but 300 feet underground. And they use them to, once they get the detector in place, to make sure that everything is aligned up right. Um, because it has to be a very precision object. So a lot of 3D mapping can be done. You can do it. There's Milan um, survey, mining survey companies that have got started and so on and so forth. So very, um, for technology, um, that was archaeological use. So, <clears throat> and I said there are line components of the detector. And so to get a peak doesn't, most contributors in a range will not even give you a peak, or their peaks are uncalculable, too dependent on technology. So the position of where they maximize depends on the technology you're using to um, measure the particle, not the case with the muon. So and I recognized that right away, and I immediately, this was 2018, I calculated where the peak was, and it wasn't where the mass was. So I thought, oh, this hypothesis, you know, looked like it was maybe true for some of the other cases, but I couldn't get past this calculation. And I was under a grant deadline to get all this stuff done. So this seemed like, oh, I'm just I'm wasting my time on this. Maybe I shouldn't pursue this anymore. And then in 2020, I realized I made a mistake. And I got my help on a particle physics colleague. And he gave me the book. There's a, also, that's part of the set of equations you use in cosmic rays and particle physics. Calculated it all out. And then here is this for different, depends on how much rock you're going through, but for a huge wide range of rock, here's where the uh, sensitivity, and you can think of that almost the same as the number of muons going through. There is a chart of it and the, versus the mass of the muon. And the mass of the muon is given by the star. Notice here, 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 here. The star's always at the peak for this 
wide range, and that's where we're at. So man, it was actually peaking out right where we're at. And so then, um, if you draw it out here, this whole region of thicknesses, this long region, um, it maximizes the ability to use it as a tool, the muon. So, and that was the only peak, really a viable peak. When I looked for it, it was there. So that was quite thrilling to get that because the amount of fine tuning here is about one in 10,000. Compared to the range of possible values of the muon, it's very, very small region. So just that and the cosmic microwave is already getting up, depending on how you, what parameter you use in the cosmic microwave case in dark energy, you're getting about to one in a million. So that's a really a lot of fine tuning. If you translate that in probability, it's like one in a million chance. That's not very likely. I mean, if I go in for minor surgery, like if I were one, that, uh, it's probably greater than one in a million. If I go into anesthesia in a, deni you know, a dentist office, I'll die. I'm not too worried about one in a million. It's more likely I'd walk across over here and drop dead with a heart attack. It's not very likely, okay? So then I had to look for alternative peaks and that reduces it a little bit and combine them together. Yeah, so summarize, I'll just say I've looked at three parameters so far and they all seem to be fine tuned. And all the other ones I looked at, in every single case where I could do the calculations, they also exhibited the fine tuning the last few were like three or four of the parameters in the spring of last year before I gave a talk on this for an all-day seminar at Rutgers University. And I was going to stay away from those cases. It was neutrinos, and they didn't know a lot about neutrinos, but I felt the pull of looking at them. So, oh, what the heck? I, I got to get this presentation. I'll look at them. And there was some hints they were fine-tuned, and I found that fine-tuning was about one in a million. So the total was nearly one in a trillion trillion. So there's no way I thought this could just be by chance. That was really a proof of this hypothesis, which is very predictive. Um, and so that, the neutrinos are down here. They have a set of parameters that govern them. So I've looked at all these ones that were possible to do. The fine tuning shows up everywhere. And in some of the case, some of them, I did my own calculations, like you saw in the case of that first one with the graph that peaked out. Um, other ones that were just putting together what physicists had already noticed. They already noticed some of these were very in special spots. And in a few cases that they were in special spots that were amazingly discoverable. It led to a, um, like ideal, they would say, or just perfect for this particular use of like the mass of the um, tau lepton. And so um, they had noticed the coincidence already. So my job in a lot of those cases was just putting them together and making their argument, their case more rigorous. Because often they'll say these things but not give you the underlying reasons. So I had to reconstruct their reasons and then calculate the actual range. Because that's not their concern. They're not concerned about, does this fall on the peak or not? They're just noticing how good it is for this major purpose. Okay, so that's pretty much um, I'll open for 10 minutes of um, questions. This might seem like an odd question. It seems apparent that you think a fine tuning argument is the strongest argument for the existence of God. It's the strongest for me. I mean, okay. there's also the other one that actually became more convincing to me, and that's early on, it was a regular list. I wrote an article, God and the Laws of Nature, for the uh, kind of leading, Philo, which was the leading atheist journal at the time, invited, it was an invited piece. And, and um, you know, one group, just one group of philosophers holds that the, um, the order of the world, it's a, called the regularity theory, it goes back to David Hume, it's just a brute fact. So electrons always repel each other, uh, that's what they always do, and there's no explanation. Then the other necessitarians say, well, no one would accept that kind of coincidence, like if a coin ever came up heads 
hundred times in a row, you wouldn't just, a two-sided coin, you wouldn't just say it was by chance, way too unlikely. So they say if you believe that, you'll believe anything, and then they develop what's called a necessitarian theory that was underlying necessities. And at least I think I showed in that particle, and the editor thought I showed it, but then he said, he just said, I'll accept the regularity theory because he wasn't, wasn't a theist. And, and um, that the necessitarians didn't do any better. So, but I just think it's so outrageous to think this order that's so mathematically precise is, is just here and there's no further explanation. It just seems to me outrageously implausible. Okay, but but the, the, the second part of my question was, uh, you also said that it seems like a benevolent God would, uh, would want us to know and see. It makes sense to me that God would. Um, so why didn't this good and benevolent God let us uh, have the tools to, have, to develop this argument before about 50 years ago? Well, but any time anytime you could say that, because remember it has to be fundamental parameters. So 50 years ago, we didn't know about the dark energy. We didn't have the tools. We had to set up the Hubble telescope to know that. We hadn't discovered the Higgs boson yet. So actually, when I started working on this, really started in particle physics 2014, that was about as early as you could start getting these cases um, because the standard model was complete by then. But it wasn't complete because they hadn't discovered the mass of the Higgs boson. So 50 years earlier it wouldn't have worked, but if it was 50 years earlier, then you would have said, well, why isn't it 50 years earlier than that? And so the same question would always arise. So um, why didn't God show this earlier? Now you might say, well, why didn't God give us it some other more direct way, like show up on a great white throne? I am God. Well, first of all, I think I would suspect that would just some, it could just be some easily explained, I think, some alien technology. It would have to really show it was God. It would have to be at the fundamental structure of things. The universe, you know, people, if, you have, if you're a fan of Star Trek, you know, they, the Enterprise with what it does, beaming, that all looks like supernatural beings doing things. So I don't think it would be, <clears throat> first of all, that convincing that it was really the creator behind the universe. I think it has to be at the level of the universe itself. And we just simply didn't know enough about the particle physics parameters are key because there's a well-defined anthropic range form. And you find that the art science is our paradigm uh, people point to for the use of rationality. And I think the development of mathematics and science actually kept a lot of superstition at bay. Even now it's hard to keep it at bay. But you could see where the use of reason really works. Right, and then you use it in other fields like, you know, government, um, more developing systems. You see, there's a, a value in reason. So I could see why God would want science to be successful in that way because it trains our minds in the use of reason. And then why God would leave at the center of science a pointer to God's self. Now I feel I don't need to fully answer that question because if you think this pattern is just far too unlikely, it's really one part in a trillion trillion, then, and you're not going to just ascribe it to chance, then it raises a really interesting question, I think, theologically. Well, what is? Why did, um, if you believe in a God, if you don't believe in them, what other explanation is there? If you do, then why would God leave this? Um, why would God make this science successful? What were God's purposes? And I think that is very interesting theologically on something I haven't fully sorted out. I have some suggestions. Those suggestions are actually, I didn't go through that because of time, but they are actually here. Um, the advantages of this, um, and, this is, and for theists, so several different things. I don't want to push the time too yeah, far here, here, so. Yeah, so there'll be opportunity for more Q&A um, at the end here. So I'm going to invite Neil um, to offer his challenge and to try to destroy mm -hmm. what Robin has done. Right. Um, I, I just want to start off by saying that I've been following this fine-tuning literature for 30 years now, and this is really new. This is a, a, a big advance, um, and I don't know how the 
the, the field that looks at this is going to absorb all this, this new information, but it really is a, a, a breakthrough, this idea of what I'll call discoverable uh, discoverability. Um, but I have been tasked with playing the role of skeptic, so uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so to begin, and I don't, I don't have a, uh, a slideshow or a handout. I'm just going to talk my way through this stuff. Yeah, sure. Take your graph sure. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, let me get a, give a little context for the project Robert's engaged in. It's called Natural Theology. Natural theology is the attempt to gain knowledge of God uh, from reason and observation alone without the help of scripture or special revelation. It's contrasted with revealed theology. So, for example, you might think that anyone with a working brain could conclude that there is a being that uh, started the universe. In fact, Aristotle uh, believed there was a prime mover. However, you, you might think that there is no way human reason alone could reach the conclusion that God is three persons in one. That would be an example of uh, revealed theology. But in a narrower sense, uh, natural theology is in particular focused on constructing arguments for the existence of God. There are many of these, and I don't know if you've covered some of them, other ones in your philosophy classes, like the cosmological argument or the moral argument. Uh, the term natural theology is uh, due to this person, William Paley, who Robin mentioned, uh, I forget if it was this morning you mentioned Paley. Um, that, that term is most closely associated with the design argument. The design argument and uh, these other kinds of arguments for the existence of God, I say they have a twofold purpose. And I guess to lay out my critique at the beginning, uh, Robin's uh, argument helps with one of those purposes, but I'm not sure it helps with the other one. The one purpose, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is to help theists come to know God better. So people who already believe in God come to know God better. Uh, but also uh, the goal, the, the hope, was that you could take a, a rational non-believer and uh, show them this evidence and if maybe they wouldn't see the light, but at least they'd, they'd come to be much more inclined to believe in the existence of God. You'd be doing it using premises even they would accept. Uh, let me say something in connection with that about the logical structure of the uh, argument that Robin is giving and of the fine-tuning argument. And I've got a kind of technical presentation of it in this handout that I made, but we, we really don't need to go over the technical presentation. Uh, I can illustrate it with an example. So let's say... Uh, uh, Josh and David and Robin and I are playing a game of poker and uh, we, we share the deal, okay? Every hand, the next person deals. And amazingly enough, um, <clears throat> the 10 times that Josh deals, uh, he deals himself an amazingly good hand and all of the rest of us uh, also, really good hands, hands that will induce us to bet a lot of money. But his hand is always better. I get four of a kind, he gets a royal flush, that kind of thing. And that happens 10 straight times, okay? Well, the, the reasoning here that's leading me to think that Josh is a cheater, and that's a pretty intuitive conclusion, uh, is uh, threefold. First of all, what's the probability of this happening if it's just a matter of chance. And if it's just a matter of chance, it is possible, it's possible that it happened, but it just seems incredibly unlikely. Uh, what's the probability of this happening if Josh uh, is cheating? And suddenly uh, that probability goes way up, right? If he's cheating, uh, then, and he has the ability to manipulate the cards, uh, then obviously it's much more, more likely. Then there's a third question that uh, I think it's important to bring out about these kinds of arguments is, <clears throat> well, we still have to ask which is more improbable that, that <clears throat> excuse me, that he won uh, these 10 deals in a row, all very unlikely, uh, or that um, he's, he's a cheater. Now, I haven't known him very long. This man has a sterling character, okay? So it will take me a lot 
it will take a lot to convince me that he's cheating despite um, his sterling character. So maybe just one hand isn't enough. Maybe two such hands aren't enough. And we could talk about the probabilities, but uh, uh, 10 in a row, uh, that's just, I don't really need to think too hard about his moral character at this point. Something fishy is going on. Okay, uh, and the same structure is had both by the fine tuning argument and this new uh, variant, the discover, discoverability signaling argument, which I call the DSA. So uh, on the fine tuning argument, the probability that the universe is just right for life if God doesn't exist is extremely low. Uh, if, it, if God does exist, that probability is, is much higher, uh, maybe even quite high. And then you have to make a judgment, well, uh, what's the probability that God exists uh, intrinsically versus the probability that the universe is just right for life? And you might think, well, even if I give, uh, I'm a pretty skeptical person and I give God a one in a million chance of existing, uh, still that might be way, way, way better than the uh, way higher than the probability that the universe is just right for life. That's why some of the numbers that Robin was talking about, you know, uh, one in a billion, one in a trillion, actually turn out to be to be relevant. You you really have to have that number in comparison to your own uh, intrinsic probability or um, um, personal probability uh, that that God exists. Okay. Now I'm not going to look at the scientific claims. As I said, I think Robin did an, an amazing job, and he's a physicist, and I'm not. Um, but I did want to talk about the theology behind these arguments, and that does involve uh, two of these premises. Now, one of them I can't really go on about here. Uh, it's, a, it's just a gigantic question. What is the intrinsic probability that God exists? What is, prior to getting all this scientific evidence, what's the probability that uh, God exists? There are people who think theism, that's the claim that God exists. There are people who think that theism is not even a logically coherent position. Uh, there are people who think that the existence of God is uh, not compatible with other things we know about the world, besides that it is discoverably discoverable or fine-tuned. For example, the existence of evil, okay? All that stuff is just a massive, massive discussion, and it's not profitable, profitable to get into it here. Um, <clears throat> We'll, we'll just say that the fine-tuning argument raises theological questions that are perennial theological questions and move on from that. But um, what I think is the, the novel part about fine-tuning arguments, and now specifically this discoverability signaling argument, <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, still fighting off a cold here. Um, why should we think that the probability is reasonably high that if God exists, God would create a, a universe of the sort that uh, Robin described, a discoverably discoverable universe, as opposed to just a regular old life-permitting universe. Why well, I think that that probability is not about as small as the probability uh, that there is a discoverably discoverable universe if God does not exist. Uh, that's a distinctive question raised by uh, this argument. Are there any reasons for thinking it's even moderately likely that God would create a universe such that intelligent beings in it can not only do advanced science, but uh, such that they can learn from advanced science just how easily the universe might not have been such as to permit advanced science. Uh, and I'll pause here. Is that, is that a fair question to ask about, you know, about the project here? Is this motivation for God? Which unfortunately, due to time constraints, it's it's he's he's got some of it on the screen right. now, right? But but he was gonna he was gonna talk about that. Yeah, yeah. but it's like the motivation for God doing it. What's the motivation for God doing it? And I'm not and and Robin didn't really get a chance to get so into that. It would but. have to be some kind of good because God is what we know about God from the basic theism is that God is perfectly good. If you accept that, then if you can glimpse that there's a good being realized, then it's not horribly improbable. Right. God would do that. Okay. So is there some good that you can okay. perceive? And, and you can amplify on this after I say what I'm going to say about what that, what that good or those goods might be. 
in accordance with the rules of natural theology, if you're trying to uh, convince that second audience, the people who aren't already uh, theists, and in particular, uh, aren't any uh, denominations so they don't accept uh, Christian scripture or uh, Muslim scripture or what have you, uh, in answering th these questions about wh why God would do it, Robin is forbidden from adverting to scripture or to other revealed sources of knowledge about God. Again, that's conditional. That's depending on Robin's audience, right? Um, uh, he can certainly have a discussion with people who share some theological uh, basics with him uh, in terms of uh, revealed knowledge, but not that other, not that other audience. Uh, and he can't do that because by its nature, design arguments are meant to exclude those sources of evidence. Otherwise, the argument can't appeal to those who don't already uh, believe in God. Now, okay, bear with me here, because you might just think, well, what you're asking is too hard, Manson. Uh, the idea motivating natural theology, and it may just be wishful thinking, is that there are intelligent, open-minded, non-theists out there who do not accept the purportedly revealed claims of Jews, Christians, or Muslims, but who do share with theists a conception of what God is supposed to be. This shared conception includes things like being omnipotent, being omniscient, being morally perfect, being uncreated, and so on. It is these open-minded non-theists who could be persuaded that God exists or could just be made to grudgingly acknowledge uh, that belief in God is not so irrational after all. That would be a big victory. That would be a big advance. Uh, if only they were prevented, presented with logical arguments that use only empirical evidence and shared claims about the nature of God. <clears throat> Furthermore, even if we cut Robin some slack when it comes to this rule, even if we allow him to employ items of revealed knowledge as support for the discoverability signaling argument, uh, Robin still needs to actually make the case that the probability of God's creating a discoverably discoverable universe is not low. He either needs to argue that creating such a universe is just what we would expect from God to do, or maybe that's too strong. Uh, maybe it's at least within a reasonably small set of options regarding what God would uh, do. Um, even with respect, respect to items of revealed theology, uh, I, I think of Psalms 19, uh, written by uh, King David, I believe. Is that supposedly written by King David? Um, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, that whole passage, which often comes up in these discussions. Um, Robin will have to argue that those items su support the expectation of discoverable discoverability in particular, rather than just a uh, life-permitting universe in general. Uh, now, Robin does attempt to do this, but notice I've got the the devastating evidence right here on the board, right? The value of a discoverable, discoverable universe for theists. But these are points made to people who are already theists. And so while bolstering and deepening the uh, beliefs uh, of theists is one of the goals of natural theology, it's not the other goal. So what about this uh, other goal? Uh, getting non-theists to believe in God, uh, or at least be more open-minded towards belief in God using premises that even they will accept. Uh, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes laying out why I'm skeptical uh, the proponents of the dis discovery signal signaling argument can meet this goal. Okay, um, raise your hand, and I'm always shocked at how quickly movies get old and are beyond the memory of students. How many of you saw the movie Avatar? Raise your hand if you saw Avatar. Okay, most people saw Avatar. Okay, in that movie, greedy earthlings invade Pandora, a planet populated, though not ruled by a humanoid species, the Navi. From what I can glean looking at the movie and the extensive wiki fandom pages for Avatar, um, they don't really have any advanced technology. They're basically comparable to Stone Age humans. They strive to live in harmony with their environment, but they do not seek to master it. Indeed, um, and I, I'm taking the word of the fan pages that this was in the movie, there are three laws of Awa, who is the being they worship, uh, and the three laws are, you shall not set stone upon stone, so you shall not build any stone buildings. 
make permanent structures. Neither shall you use the turning wheel, so there will be no wheel to vehicles, nor use the metals of the ground. Uh, so no digging for ores and no metallurgy. Um, I'm not, I didn't really actually like the Navi as I watched the movie. I, I was like almost rooting for the earthlings because I don't, I'm not really, I find environmentalists annoying and I thought the message was a little over the top, but still, <clears throat> it's a good thought experiment, okay? And so the question is, if the fine structure constant in the universe were such that metallurgy were impossible or other aspects of these constants were such that metallurgy were impossible, but that otherwise intelligent life were, were possible so that the universe, uh, in this scenario, the universe couldn't produce a, produce a technologically advanced species like us, but it could still produce uh, a species like the Navi, okay? In that case, would the universe be uh, a somewhat less good place. I, I think Robin thinks so, and I, I probably think so, but uh, must non-theists agree? I'm not even, need theists even agree? Uh, consider that King David uh, had no great advantage over the Navi in terms of understanding the universe. He had no telescopes, no microscopes. He didn't have a large Hadron Collider. Yet for all that, it seems his appreciation of God's creation is no worse than ours, all right? So in answering these questions, uh, we have to avoid being biased in favor of our own way of life, uh, not just uh, not only our own biological life, but our own way of living, all right? Uh, I'm from Maryland. I love blue crabs. Uh, that's what I grew up on. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, I'm very happy that I uh, grew up in an environment where blue crabs were plentiful. I was right by the Chesapeake Bay. But that's not because of the intrinsic greatness of blue crabs. That's because I grew up uh, where those kinds of crabs were part of my cuisine. If I were to conclude that God designed the Chesapeake Bay for the production of blue crabs, I would be exhibiting partiality and bias. Might the same partiality and bias uh, be uh, at work in this discoverability signaling argument, um, we certainly like advanced science and technology, but in addressing the question of God's motive for creation, we have to set aside our own feelings about uh, that technology or our own, our own comfort with it, and instead ask this question, based only on the pure philosophical conception of God, coupled with what we know about modern science, is creating a discoverably discoverable world something we would expect God to do? Is it more likely than creating a world that isn't discoverably discoverable, but that is otherwise friendly to the existence of intelligent life? Uh, and now again, this is my job to be the, the skeptic here, but there are certain downsides of uh, discoverability. Robin points out uh, that technology can be a great aid to human flourishing, and I agree with that, but but a lot of people see more problems than benefits from modern technology. I'm thinking in particular of the very many environmentalists who would say that uh, modern technology has enabled the domination and the destruction of nature. I can imagine such a person listening to Robin's talk and shaking their fist at the heavens. Um, <clears throat> if the creator had not set things up exactly so, there wouldn't be any metallurgy. There wouldn't be any internal combustion engines, no global warming, no genetically modified organisms, no atomic bombs, no mass destruction of the planet. God could have spared us all of those possibilities, but instead did the exact opposite. What kind of God would do that? Okay. Low regard for modern scientific technology is not necessarily restricted to uh, non-theists. Uh, there are certainly Christians who reject parts of modern science. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, modern scientific medicine. When I say they reject it, uh, they just don't want to use it. They avoid surgeries, vaccines, blood transfusions, and so forth. Uh, the denominations who have this viewpoint are, are various. Uh, uh, then you look at, at groups like the Amish, who are just indifferent to, and at, at best, I would say, towards incorporating scientific technology into their lives. 
Uh, it seems to me they could take it or leave it, okay? Uh, so now my point isn't that scientific technology is bad. It's the point, the point is that a reasonable non-theist can rightly wonder what basis there is for thinking that God would be more likely to create a discoverably discoverable universe rather than some other kind of life permitting universe. Perhaps the probability uh, that I mentioned as part of this argument, the probability that uh, if God exists, God would create a discoverably discoverable universe, perhaps it's just inscrutable. Uh, maybe it's something that we, where we just can't know what it is or even make a good guess of it. Uh, and now I'm gonna do, do a little plug here. I don't know, I didn't know in advance when I gave this talk what the audience was gonna be, but if there are any of you who are really interested in diving in deeper into this fine tuning argument, I left on the very back corner of the, the table on the way out, some handouts with uh, a, a bibliography, just a, a list of, of key readings, including uh, many things Robin has written. Um, and one section is about the theology behind these, these arguments, the fine tuning argument. I think that that's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of profitable work to be done looking at that question, but that's really, uh, to, get to, to get to my conclusion here, um, that, that's really the conclusion I, I wanna um, push about this argument. I think Robin's new version of the fine tuning argument addresses a lot of problems that confronted the fine tuning argument in particular I need to think more about it, but I, I uh, suspect it, it addresses very wonderfully this problem of infinite ranges, which has occupied uh, the minds of a lot of philosophers. So in that case, the, the discovery sign signaling argument is a big advance. However, I don't think uh, it allays the concerns skeptics have about the second premise of the fine tuning argument, the premise that God is, is reasonably likely to do this thing, to create a universe this way. On the contrary, I think it heightens them. Whatever the probability is that God wants there to be a, this is a little logic here, a, a universe with intelligent life in it, that probability is gonna be higher than the probability that God wants there to be a, a universe with intelligent life in it such that b, it's a universe in which the intelligent living beings in it can discover through science that a creator wanted the universe to have intelligent life in it, okay? Just a <clears throat> little logic here. It's always more probable that I'm wearing a sweater than that I am wearing a blue sweater because wearing a blue sweater entails that I'm wearing a sweater, but not the other way around, okay? Uh, a universe is being uh, discoverably discoverable entails that it has intelligent life in it but um, uh, having intelligent life in it doesn't entail that it's discoverably discoverable. So uh, it seems to me that the probability of that second premise of the discoverability signaling argument is gonna be at least a little bit lower, right, than the, uh, the probability in the fine tuning argument. So whatever, my, and, and to, to end here, whatever the advantages are of the discoverability signaling argument over the fine tuning argument, they will have to be weighed against the disadvantage the, that the discoverability signaling argument has uh, compared to the fine tuning argument with regards to that second premise, the premise about the sort of universe God might be expected to create. Uh, and those are my comments, thank you. And then did you want us to get all to get together now or? or uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, Ron's gonna respond. Um, response here, first I do wanna point out as I did the argument on the PowerPoint, I actually am not framing the discoverability argument as an argument for theism. It just is an interesting pattern um, that is as if somebody was trying to send a signal. But I'm willing to go along with it, you know, as an argument for God. But then the second point I make is you're not sort of, you don't start with discerning, well, what would God do or what would God desire? You start with discerning if God's a perfect, if you start with the, the version of God where God's um, that most like Christians, apart from divine revelation, if for reasons I said in the um, last talk, if God is perfectly good, then as long as you can glimpse some good realized by this discoverability, then God will have a reason for doing it. And that gives you a much more of a probability, I think, 
than it happening by chance. So it's not trying to peek into what all God's desires would be. All you need to do is, is to glimpse there being some good, and that's that's um, firming both faith and reason. There's a whole bunch of stuff I'd see, ingenuity and power of God. I can discern glimpse of reason why, and I think that's sufficient to make it not hugely improbable, at least not one in a trillion trillion. And then the final point I'd make is that <clears throat> at the very end, um, Neil, the um, way he cashed it out is I was starting from just what is called in philosophy like bare theism, not knowing anything about the nature of God. But if with this kind of evidence, you don't really need to start from bare theism. So suppose, you know, in 2012, let's say, or even more recently, I'd come up with this thesis and I go talk to an atheist. I say, well, if you did believe in God, would you believe, if you, you believe in a God, would you believe that God desired the um, science to be successful? Of course you would, because science is successful. So if you believe that God created the universe, that's going to become as part of the package you have, that God would want the success of science, because otherwise it wouldn't be here, okay? <clears throat> it wouldn't be the successful science if God created it. So we already have that data. So then, Given that kind of God who wants life, wants the success of science, the real question is, is there a probability that that kind of God would also want to signal that success? That's the, and, um, or maybe also the first part of it was making that discoverability evident in the parameters, if it's evident in the laws or it's in the laws, so the first one I pursued is this optimal for scientific discovery. If it looks like it's in the laws, that just looks slight extension into the parameters. So you're not really going real far out from what you already know. And then you ask, would that kind of God also want it to be discoverable? discoverable? So I think that's the way you need to focus um, the question because anybody who's an atheist or a theist they think about it before they're presented with this discoverability, discoverability data, they're bound to agree that God wanted, desired for the success of science because it's there. So. Yeah, so here I just want to invite you two to kind of interact with each other um, and then we'll open it up for further Q&A. Okay, so Robin, if you could elaborate on what you just said there. Um, you said the, the let's say there's a non-believer and you ask them, uh, what do they expect God to do? Well, their conception of God isn't just bare theism. They already know that we have a world with uh, 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 scientific technology in it. And so they would, that would condition their conception of God so that God, at the very least, is okay with scientific technology, if not actually wants it. I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, can you explain that move more? Because by that same reasoning, then, uh, you... you the, the non-theists really can't run an argument from evil. They would say, well, we observe evil. There's got to be a reason for that. Uh, so I've got to change my conception of God or modify it so that that makes sense. What Exactly what they're saying when they're raising the problem of evil is that it's their antecedent conception of God. Right. The, 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 the God is the absolutely perfect being that is incompatible with what they uh, observe in the world. Um, so could you respond to that? Does that question make yeah, sense? Yeah, that question makes sense, but you're not, in that case, using, you're, you're not using evil, this is what you'd predict God would do, but there's an antecedent, I agree, there's an antecedent with um, evil that what's the probability of there being this kind of being, and, and given there's um, evil in the world, and then you have to appeal to the antecedent <laughs> conception of God. Okay. So if I was offering the success of science as evidence for God that, you know, in the laws, the success right. in the laws, what Einstein and Wigner talked about, then I would have to appeal to an antecedent conception. Okay. But if I'm offering um, this as this additional evidence, then I don't need to appeal to an antecedent conception. I could put that in the background. Okay. That it, what, what the kind of God I'm talking about is this, and then they might 
render that kind of God, they might think, well, that a kind of God that would create science and technology, that's just really improbable antecedently that God would right. do that. So then, then then they could, but if they don't have that, it's fair for me yeah, to include okay. that. Okay. If you can include any evidence in your background is the idea, it, that's not biased against the other side. And we do that in the courtroom, right? There's a lot of particular features of the evidence that are just irrelevant, that don't push one way or another. And as long as it defend, you know, the uh, prosecuting um, doesn't say, well, we're gonna assume this is part of the background, and, um, and, but it's the background actually is evidence in favor of the defense, then it would be improper to include it. So you're free to include anything in the background in arguing for a case as long as it's not biased against your opponent to include it. Okay. That's the kind of principle I'm okay. thinking of. Um, can I, this is free ranging, just, okay. I just, I had some. By good objection, you caused okay. me to think of you. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so what's your conception about, well, let me back up here. There are two parts of the story. There's the nature of the universe for discoverability, but there's also the nature of the discoverers, the scientists, right. the beings, right? Um, it, are you thinking that God foresaw that the, well, let me put this just for everybody who knows this. There's a lot of contingency in the history of science and technology. There's a lot of luck. There are a lot of uh, oddball chances uh, even the development of the scientific instruments that we regard as vital to the enterprise involves a, a, a lot of luck, a lot of chance. Um, I'm thinking of the story of the discovery of radioactivity, right? That was one. There's, there's a really good case actually from uh, neuroscience that uh, a guy at Mississippi State, John Bickle, talks about where there's this one little technical problem that all the neuroscientists, uh, it was their technical hurdle, and one person in one lab found a solution to it, and it sent the trajectory of the field in this one direction. But if that technical problem hadn't been, by very lucky chance, solved, it would have gone in another direction, okay? So in regards to this uh, discoverability signaling argument, it is, relative to the instrumentation that we have, to the uh, uh, technology that we, that we have, do you think the development of that technology was, if not inevitable, sort of, we were gonna find it out eventually? Like, there are people who think that, okay, yeah, Einstein discovered relativity, but uh, if he hadn't, somebody would have. It was in the cards, it was, it was coming. You know, you might think that about uh, the progress of science in general. Is that something you believe about scientific and technological pro progress? And it seems like you have to believe it for this picture to work out. Well, no, I don't have to believe it. I could also have the option, maybe God was providentially working behind the scenes, okay. as far as I know. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to put my foot down either way because I honestly don't know. Okay. That maybe, you know, I think like... Um, you know, if it just on another score with the problem of evil, like if you look at what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was actually, we were very lucky right. that the Russians didn't fire because they had this extra person on the submarine and the two commanders were going to fire the missile. Right. And maybe there's certain points that God does intervene. So God's not a helicopter parent, but when the kid really needs money, right. you know, right. and really needs help, otherwise they're going to completely fail out in life, that okay. God comes along and helps. Maybe that God did that in the history of life. I don't know. I'm not either pushing that or not because I, the evidence for me is not in on that. But I, I have that as a possibility. And then, and then in, in connection with that, what about the kind of beings that evolve? So it looks like um, just for example, an aquatic species has, you know, I don't know if you've, any of you have interacted with dolphins. They're really, really smart, you know, but maybe there's a limit on just how smart they can get because they can't do fire. certain, they can't do fire. Yeah, right? so they couldn't have yeah. developed the and, kind and, of technology and, and, we have. And do you think that uh, the evolution of beings that have the capacity to to uh, make these discoveries 
right? They're, they're going to have to have certain characteristics. They're going to have to be terrestrial, for example. Um, I think they're going to have to have binocular vision. Uh, except their planet is not going to have to not be surrounded by uh, or have, have a thick atmosphere around it. Um, but do you, do you think that the development of the, just those kinds of beings to do this kind of science is in a way uh, determined in an evolutionary sense, it's gonna happen in the same way that you could maybe predict a billion years ago that one way or another, you're gonna get uh, binocular vision, vision, you're gonna get flight. These are things that have come up over and over, over again. So I kind of, am, I kind of am inclined towards um, Simon Conway Morse's Simon Conway thesis, Morse is who I was a convergent of. evolution that, you know, he has a book in, um, inevitable, inevitable humans in a lonely universe, I think it's yes. called. And so there's a kind of inevitability about what evolution's going to produce, unlike what Stephen Jay Gould, other Harvard, late Stephen Jay Gould, Harvard paleontologist, thought if you rewound the um, tape of life, it'd come out completely different. It was really, there was much more historical contingency. But they see a lot of cases where certain kinds of features come out over and over again. Even interestingly, the marsupial and placental, like wolves, and you know, perhaps they look alike, even though they had very different evolutionary histories. So them, there seems to be convergence on certain patterns. And so he's really big at pushing that thesis. So I actually am inclined towards thinking that. And that, that brings up a point I do want to raise about, you raised about Avatar. I don't see any, I don't think, um, God, you have to think, our form of life is better, as long as there's some good about creating beings like us with this advanced technology, then that's good enough for God to create it. It realizes a unique good. So God could, maybe there is another planet or another universe in which it's the avatar, you know. Right, okay. Yeah. So as far as I know, there's all different kinds. And there is, it's like God didn't have to create us within Christian theology. God created angels and other, be, other kinds of beings. So that doesn't mean that we have to be better than the angels. Maybe God just created both. So, yeah, I was actually just going to ask you that. Uh, what you're saying is not incompatible with elsewhere in the universe or even on this planet, there being uh, beings that are... Well, the usual target of the fine-tuning argument has been uh, intelligent life. Right. Right? When I say the usual target... For, for the design art, you may have to specify a kind of being that's the sort of being you would expect God to create. And some people have said just mere, merely living beings, although it's hard to see what's so special about a, a, you know, a bacterium or something. Uh, some people have said uh, complex life, uh, intelligent life, self-conscious intelligent life. There are a lot of different ways to specify it. Uh, of course, the possibility for any of those is entailed by the possibility of uh, life that's capable of discovering that the universe is discoverable, right? So, so it's compatible with what you're saying that um, these other kinds of life are also valued by God and that God uh, might have, uh, there might be that kind of life elsewhere, even, though, even if it doesn't uh, rise to the level. I'm not trying to... Uh, is there a cosmic pecking order here, I guess, you know, that, that the discover the beings that can uh, discover that the universe is discoverable have found the, their, their way up there, right, uh, in the great chain of being, so to well, speak? I'm not ascribing to a great chain of being. I okay. Mean, importance. I mean, it's uh, maybe the least in the body of Christ or the greatest. Yeah, okay. So I All don't, right. don't okay. want to say that. I, I just... I think I am committed to saying there is some good being realized. Okay. I think a perfectly good God wouldn't have done it unless, I guess God could have done it for just play, but then I think play and fun is some good. What, what would you say about the, I was kind of the problem of evil argument I was raising. The downside of all of this, of course, is it opens up a possibility that wasn't possible or wouldn't be possible uh, with more uh, uh, limited technologies, and that is all the stuff. You know, I yeah, I, I got to I got to make I got to make this comment here because I'm here in Southern California driving around. You know, uh, I, on the one hand, I go, this is magnificent. I mean, it's so you know, you see the snow-capped peaks in the in the background. But I also think, what did we humans do to 
create this sprawling thing that is, so I hope I'm not, you're, you're nodding. Okay, like it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. At the very least, it's a mixed bag. There's some, there is some bad to it. Um, what do you say about that uh, response to your discoverability signaling argument that it, it carries some baggage with it? Probably does carry some baggage with it. I, you know, I think there's always downsides. It's whether the upsides are more than the downsides, or at least neutral. Okay. So I, I don't think it's ne necessarily an unequivocal good. I'd have to think through. And, and I would see it, I'm, I wanted to put it out there among the theological community. Um, what does this tell us about God? Is there, what's, what is the good of technology? To begin to really ask that question. What would be, what would be the good that God would create a world that we can have advanced technology? And then further with the signaling one, what would be the good of that? And what would be the downsides? I just think those are really interesting questions that opens up. You know, and you can speak to this because I, I think you know some of the same people. I can guess what some current proponents of the fine tuning argument would say, which is that what it's showing is, is that God wants us to, to, to use technology to actually spread, right? To spread across the universe that like they, they see right. a, a, they see a, um, a purpose for us, and that is to be the beings that spread throughout whatever, the nearby galaxy, the whole galaxy. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you've heard this in, in conversation. Right, right. Yeah. So maybe that could be a purpose. That would be the great extra value of technology as opposed to just um, uh, intelligent life that couldn't escape its, its planet. So maybe you should, you know, I think it's the NASDAQ you should invest in, or the technology, which funds the technology stocks, right? NASDAQ, yeah. 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 <laughs> you have a prediction here about <laughs> the future of technology, that it'll flourish. But, you know, it could, maybe, maybe that this is it for discoveries in that fundamental level with science, that it was only to get to the signaling part. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I used mm. to think, well, maybe this did extrapolate that technologies were continuing to discover more and more, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe the real purpose yeah. was, because only with particle physics and these others do you have that fixed anthropic yeah. region, yeah. that well calculable that you can get a, a um, discoverability yeah. fine tune region. Do we, we've been talking for a little bit, has this discussion, do we have additional questions from the audience sparked by this at all or anything anyone wants to ask? Can you repeat, oh, can, can you try yeah, to summarize the, I, his questions? Yeah, you were, you were wondering how I'd respond to somebody that said that this all just is coherent by chance. They would agree it's coherent, theism is coherent, but they'd say, well, other sides equally coherent, but that's part of the point of the discoverability of discoverability. It's very, very unlikely to occur by chance. You know, if you just did an equal probability distribution over that space, it'd be one part in a trillion trillion. Even if you had some other scale, any other natural scale, and I've looked at a lot of different natural scales, it still turns out really, really unlikely. So that is, gives us good reason to think, no, it wasn't just by chance, that somehow there was a teleology in there. Now maybe you think of a non-theistic teleology like um, Thomas Nagel, he has a book out on that. Um, that's not a theistic book, but somehow teleology, a, a purpose-driven order of the world is for a purpose. So you could look at that hypothesis. So um, I, in my actual writing on this one, I don't, I, that's why I do the as if. I don't want to build into the hypothesis a designer, because it's really about the order of the world that has a special order. Then second comes, what's the best explanation of this? Can I ask Robin? Have you shown this, these, these calculations to uh, any physicists who are not really invested in or steeped in the fine tuning argument? And did you get any wow reactions or you know, what's well, the reception? The one on the cosmology with Don Page, who was a student of Stephen Hawking. Now he is a Christian, but he's not very, he, he believes in a kind of Everett multiverse. And he's not really, he's not enthralled very much by fine tuning arguments. So he did agree with the calculations. He was uh, one of the first cosmologists. He, yeah, he, I, he agreed with them. Did he go, wow, what was the, re I'm asking what the reaction was. 
I think the reaction was more in th that first case, he tried to put it on a different scale okay. to a logarithmic scale, but it won't, it won't, once you get the dark okay. energy in, I don't think that will work. Okay. So I have, what I'm doing, the plan is, is to get this by, to have every, the calculations, everything thoroughly checked. Okay. But I have to be really wrong across the board because a lot of them already have okay. been checked. Um, and a lot of them are just what physicists already state. And then the next stage is to really start passing it by the skeptic. But it's getting, I want to get the act together to make sure it's okay. really okay. clear what's going on. I think that's better than to go to the skeptic for that. Okay. Peter's question was, uh, I gave the analogy of, of being in this environment, uh, Southern California, that has some immense beauty but also some eyesores and wondering where it is in balance. And then he said, well, if you step back, what about the ability to even uh, make, that, uh, make that observation to raise that question? Is that something that uh, needs to, ex to be explained? Um, that's a good question. I feel that's getting into a different category of argument than the fine tuning argument, and I'm not going to you know, I don't want to address it here, but I think that's more in the category of the moral argument or there are also aesthetic arguments for the existence of God. The fact that we have the ability to recognize right and wrong, the fact that we see a moral order in the universe and that we, we uh, uh, approach reality with this standard is, is points to the existence of God. I don't know what to say about that. I think it's a different can of worms than the fine tuning argument, but it's not. Yeah, I don't, maybe we can talk with other philosophers about that later. I'm, I'm punting on that one. I, I punt. I often punt. Can, can I take this one first? Yeah. I'm going to take this one first, and then Robin can respond. Uh, your, your question was, um, <clears throat> how do you respond to somebody like G.K. Chesterton who puts uh, faith above reason? And it seems like this approach is, is very much invested on the reason side. Um, there are philosophers, and I didn't build this into my talk because it'd make it too long. There are philosophers like Alvin Plantinga, mentioned earlier by David. Did, did you have him? He spoke here, right? Um, who uh, actually are not very high on natural theology at all as an enterprise, right? They, he, in some, he's changed his tune over the years, and in, in the book Where the Conflict Really Lies, I think he's evolved on that issue. But earlier in his career, he basically... Uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but natural theology, take it or leave it, okay? That's one attitude you can have. Another attitude you can have is that by basing your belief in God on science or even letting science strongly inform your conception of God, you're, you're making a big mistake. You're going down the wrong pathway. Uh, uh, maybe even you're being deceived or, or something, um, since I'm not the one making this kind of argument, I'm only just responding to the kinds of argument. You know, I, I, I'll let Robin answer that question. Was that a fair characterization that there are theists uh, who think this kind of project is uh, at, at best of little value and at worst really misguided? And how do you respond to those people when they raise that kind of point? Well, I tend to think that if you put faith and reason in conflict, then I think you do have real problems. Just practically, it leads to a kind of fideism and gullibility in the, and just believing in authority figures. And uh, there's a kind of can be a, a gullibility about that. And people can then start down the path of believing all kinds of things that I would consider the evidence is stacked against. So I think there needs to be a principle of following the evidence where it leads. Now, I do think Planinga does do that because he has a kind of, um, uh, his anti-evidentialism, you have to answer objections. So that's one thing I would say just about that okay. issue. But the other one, I don't think, I think it's a faulty conflict because I think both of them rest upon a certain kind of intuition. I think science ultimately rests upon you do inference the best explanation. At the end of the day, you say, this explanation makes more sense of the data than this explanation. When you actually look underneath the surface of what's going on, it's 
people have, and people have, there's a lot of disagreement within the scientific community because people have different ways of weighting the evidence. What's the most simple hypothesis? So there's an intuitive basis already of how the world works, what hypotheses are likely to be true. I think that in kind of intuitive basis underlies your moral thinking. You have moral intuitions. And I also think you have sort of spiritual intuitions, particularly intuitions of um, the good, what is good, um, that they're, they're kind of moral and spiritual about spiritual reality. And so, all the, so I think the heart of faith is a sort of intuition. So I think they share that in common. It's just what kind of intuitions are you going to accept? But I think all of them need to be tested against each other and other things you know. So in that sense, in that sense, I'm in favor of reason. It's always, there's always a testing you need to do. Don't just believe anything because somebody says it. Or you ha don't believe everything you think either, or you intuit as being true. It has to always go through a testing process. And that's, I consider, the essence of reason. And that's going to apply as much to faith as anything else. But that's kind of, I have a more, that kind of understanding of faith. And can, can I um, amplify on a reason or a, a value of the kind of thing Robin is doing and, and the fine-tuning argument? Uh, I heard it put well recently by uh, Luke Barnes, who is a physicist who's written, co-authored a book, uh, 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 Life, uh, well, what's it called? Uh, 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 a Fortunate Universe, right. A Fortunate Universe Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos. If you, if you kind of look back at the last 200 years of scientific history, for much of it, uh, theists were scorned. I would say especially after uh, the development of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, right? We've got all the answers. Uh, life arose for no reason and the universe has been around forever. End of discussion. You know, that was kind of the attitude for uh, uh, for, for many atheists. Now you've got this fine-tuning argument, and even if it's not going to change the minds of the atheists or the, the skeptics, at least it, it says, all right, you wanted us to step up and show how we're scientific? Here we go. Ball's in your move, right? Your move. Ball's in your court. And I think there's a lot of value to that. So even if, if the, these arguments don't just cause somebody to change their mind on the spot. They really do change the state of play. And I think that can be of, of a lot of value to theists. Well said. That's exactly what I think one of the big values of it is. Yeah. Well, I got it from Robin. So, you know. I mean, I got it from Luke. So uh, I got it from Luke. So um, Luke got it from Robin. Luke got it from Robin. Yeah. But, you know, one of these is I think actually one of the values I do stress, I think it's later in there is, maybe it's early on, confidence in the power of reason. I think that was actually important. I think um, we wouldn't have had, if it wasn't for the development of science, why well, think we would be even confident in mathematical truths? Because it was just a head game people were playing. Think about it. You play this head game of mathematics. There's all this abstract stuff. And then it suddenly turns out to have all this applicability to the world. And we gain confidence in the power of reason. And I'll, I think that was one of the purposes that is putting reason and faith back together. I think this helps do it. That, um, so I say that earlier, that at the center of what we think of as our paradigm of reason, success of science affirms both faith and reason that they go together. So our thing we associate the most with reason is actually pointing beyond it. That's be beautifully put. Uh, this has been just a fantastic connection time. And I'm just kind of considering here at this moment, you know, if there are any maybe final remarks that either of you want to offer in terms of um, maybe thoughts on the edges of your mind, maybe things you want to think more about um, or um, conclusions. I think just for me, something that's kind of on the edge of my mind is thinking about theories of fundamental reality that can maybe explain the data um, in a way that is kind of on the journey of, of not so much arguing for theism or trying to defend atheism from the arguments, but trying to figure out 
like, what is the sort of best, simplest description of fundamental reality that would predict discoverability, discoverability for discoverability, to Steve's question, why we didn't discover this 50 years earlier, um, the whole sort of story of reality leading to this discoverability of discoverability. Um, is, is very fascinating for me to think of more about. And I Actually, you know, with my work on it, it was about as early as you could discover it. Yeah. You know, with the development, I was working on this in 2010. Higgs boson was discovered in 2012, which was one of the primary ones that led me to the deeper pattern. Well, even your story of having the hypothesis and then believing it was falsified twice right. Actually, is seven, itself seven interesting. Times, okay, seven times. Different, let's look at it different parameters. And so then, it was, so it shows it's a falsifiable hypothesis. Yeah. You thought you falsified it, well, um, and then checked it and confirmed it. Is, right, and so because um, it's actually much easier to make a mistake that makes it look false, because there's way more ways for it to be false, and you're, you can miscalculate and get the wrong answer than calculate correctly and get the right answer. <laughs> so. Um, I had something else I wanted to say, but I think I'll wait and we think about it after Neil uh, says. Just a, a follow up on what Josh said. Um, we're in an interesting time in intellectual history. There's, it's, it's not just atheism versus theism right now. Uh, people are opening themselves up to some really quite different theories of fundamental reality. Uh, one that it sounds like what was on Josh's mind is believing in some sort of fundamental teleology, fundamental purposiveness without uh, God. Uh, there, there's a, an increasing belief uh, in primitive mentality somehow permeating the universe. There's been a big uptick in what's called panpsychism in the philosophy of mind community. It's been really surprising to see this attitude grow that that at its most fundamental level, reality is somehow partly mental. And I don't know what to make of all this stuff, but these kinds of considerations Robin is raising play right into that, that, that discussion. So it's not just the old style, you know, Marxists versus Christians or whatever. It's, it's, it's a different uh, different scene now, a lot more options. I don't know if, Judge, if you want to comment on that, Robin or John. Well, I want to comment on, uh, I think it's kind of a little bit related. Uh, for what it does for Christians, I think, you know, there's a lot of Christians, it's like because they think faith and reason are in conflict with each other, they basically dismiss science. And I think we've seen a lot of that, the skepticism um, towards science and and then scientists think of Christians or theists as just being God of the gaps, you know, God does a miracle here and as opposed to the um, operation of science. But if this is right, then God, if God has providentially arranged things for science, this gives a strong positive reason for doing science and that it's a good, really good thing. And hopefully that breaks down that kind of dichotomy, which I think is, much more harmful than helpful um, that between faith and reason. So evidence for the success and value of science from an argument pointing to uh, some kind of theistic picture is uh, very valuable and interesting. Because, but culturally, yeah. because culturally they see, they see a lot of, you know, people saying, oh, the scientists, they're just all deceived here and here, and they're you know, undercutting our faith, and there's this conflict mm -hmm. we get culturally on both sides, and then, of course, people like Dawkins do it from the other side. Evolutionary theory has destroyed the faith, you know? And so this brings it kind of back together, which I think is be beneficial for society at large. Want to summarize her question? May I? Yeah, you okay. may. Her question was, well, the discoverability signaling argument is sending the message that science is valuable and God wants us to do science. But in many respects, there are uh, modern science is, is not what a lot of Christians want to hear. You said uh, some people are opposed to uh, climate science, for example. I would go even deeper and people who are giving uh, supposedly scientific explanations of why people are religious at all, right? And, and then 
Do you have to, what, what should the attitude be towards all those different aspects of science that really seem to undercut uh, the seam, I'll put the word on, emphasis on seam, uh, undercut uh, the foundations of, of Christian belief or just theistic belief? Well, there is a place, and I, I would want to say there is a place for some scientific skepticism. Sometimes, especially when scientists get into more philosophical issues, they can be very bad reasoners. And so I, it's more following reason, and it's more keeping science to its ideal, because often science drifts from its ideal. The ideal is open civil debate and discussion of issues and not squelching of views that um, run contrary to even the consensus. So um, I think it's pushing for that ideal. I think that ideal is really important. I, I was impressed just when reading, like I read a lot of physics articles having to do with the Large Hadron Collider. Well, people from every religion come there and they speak a common language and in an ideal, ideally science works, it allows for outliers, creative new ideas, ideally, but also has all the, all, so much of the work has to be done working together in community. So you can have a very ideal mix of that. But often science, because human beings, the, the flaws of human beings, um, deviate from that ideal. So I think there always is a place which Christians should advocate of bringing it back to its ideal of, of um, open debate, following evidence. Um, and when science deviates from that, we should critique it. So I, I um, and when science becomes politicized, then it can go off the rails also. Um, it could be it's polarized and squelching of open debate. So. Well, I feel like this conversation was an open right. debate and very fruitful and productive. And um, so this is- And I should just say about all this, I, I'm not the kind of person, I'm not offering this to convince anybody of the existence of God because I don't feel, I don't have those supernatural powers to do that. As a Christian, I believe that's the job of the Holy Spirit. So my job is just to articulate um, what I think is the, Best do the best job I can of where I think the evidence is leading and try to work on uncovering that evidence. But people are going to have to make, um, draw their own conclusions from that. That's not my job to um, convert people. You just to be honest. All right, well, thank you again so much. Really appreciate this time. Thank you. Thank you all.